Hi, I'm Maddie and I'm our facilitator for today. Thank you for joining the POCUS Certification Academy for today's mentoring conversation. We are now starting, so all lines have been muted. Please set your chat box settings to all attendees and panelists and use the chat box for any questions or comments you have throughout the conversation. I'm going to pause there so that everyone can set your chat box to all attendees and panelists. Today's conversation is focused on answering your POCUS questions. So please engage with us on the chat box and submit your questions throughout our time together. We have a fantastic panel of experts today. Unfortunately, Robert Cole Painter is unable to join us. However, we have Professor of Surgery in the Division of Vascular Surgery at the University of Washington School of Medicine and the Medical Director of Vascular Laboratory at the University of Washington Medical Center, Dr. Zeeler, Dr. Sheehan from the University of Iowa Hospitals and Clinics, and Lori Goble Rise from the Global POCUS, who is the Global POCUS Program Manager for the Point of Care Certification Academy. Panelists, it's great to have you here with us today. Thank you for joining us. So today's webinar, today's session is all about answering your Q&A, your questions with us today. So we did ask for questions to be submitted in advance and you can engage in the chat box with us today. So I want to start off by asking all of our attendees in the chat box to tell us where you're calling in from. So go ahead and chat in there where you're calling from, where you're joining us from. I want to see all of the countries, all of the different cities that you're calling in from, and it's really a joy to have you join us. I also see some questions are starting to roll in, and I'm gonna start with the first one that was submitted during registration. And I think that this one's a great one for you, Dr. Sheehan and you, Dr. Zeeler. But we've had a number of people ask us, how did you learn POCUS? And Dr. Sheehan, I'm just going to ask for you to unmute yourself. So the first time actually uh, I thought about uh, POCUS was uh, when I was in the medical intensive unit uh, during my third year of uh, second round of rotation. Because uh, here the intensive care unit has advanced uh, uh, POCUS program. Actually, each year they host the training for the Midwest uh, Pulmonology Critical Care Fellow coming here to do the training. Then I thought that the POCUS was very useful and answer a lot of questions, obviously in the ICU for procedurals and the patient safety. I feel that it can be applied to the outpatient setting too. So, but after I graduate, the department asked me to stay as a faculty. Then I talked to the chairperson at that time, Dr. Uh, James Rana. Actually, he is in Dr. Zainer's uh, institution as the chairperson there. He was very supportive. So I wanted to do some training with uh, Sonocyte. At that time, they had like a uh, visual medicine. A workshop in a major city and only $50 for each half day session. So I did a several rounds, then uh, started working with the in house resources. Uh, here we have a pulmonology uh, and uh, emergency physicians, they are focus trained. Then that's where we started. Then we started to uh, train our resident. Now we have a clinic rotation for them. Okay, well, um, my route to POCUS was a little bit different because as a vascular surgeon, I, I started to do, to do uh, my own ultrasound exams before we even, before the term POCUS was even invented. Because uh, the vascular lab really started in vascular surgery practices just with simple Dopplers and, and uh, uh, indirect physiologic tests like measuring ankle pressures. And uh, I learned to do that uh, as a vascular surgery fellow. And I, I, I straddle both the diagnostic ultrasound worlds and the focus world because I'm medical director of our vascular lab and we do full diagnostic studies. Uh, and I spend really most of my time doing that. But um, 
But on the other hand, when I when I go around and see patients, I carry a Doppler and, and I can do some basic uh, vascular scanning myself, even though uh, I, I prefer to leave the complicated stuff to the sonographers that are really good at it. Thank you both very much. Second question that came in was also submitted during registration. This one's a little bit of a long one, so I'm gonna read it and then um, I'll also pop it into the chat. The question is, why are there some patients that just don't image well? Low hydration, maybe some crazy fluid effect we can blame on the statin meds? For example, I'll walk in to image a fit, middle-aged female shoulder and expect sterling images. But what I get is washed out, poorly defined interfaces and difficult to resolve fibers. And then they continue, but I think that that, that really gives us a good feel for the, the question. As a vascular surgeon, I don't really have a good answer for that. I mean, there's a, I mean that the, the person who asked that question was making reference to MSK exams, which um, are usually are not that, uh, don't involve deep depths the way uh, some abdominal scanning, for example, would would involve. So you can't blame bowel gas or um, anything like that on, on not being able to find a joint. So uh, uh, I'm going to have to pass on that. But but there are I, I I know exactly what the what the person who asked that question is talking about. But I don't have a a good explanation for it. Should I blame the starting? Maybe I don't know. And I do have the personal experience too that uh, uh, sometimes uh, with a uh, fit person, then you're expecting some so much better image quality. I'm not sure uh, the exact uh, why the image quality is poor, but something we thought about is that uh, do you have enough gel? And uh, my experience, especially with someone for cardiac, they have a hair over the chest. I always have a hard time to obtain the best quality picture there. Um, I don't know the actual like a physical based answer, physics or, or some some principle than that. But I thought maybe because of the ultrasound how it works it requires the interface and require certain attenuation. So maybe everybody viewed it differently. Uh, These are great, thank you. One that just came in via the chat, it's um, coming from our friend in Singapore. How does one set the ultrasound machine for a large polycystic kidneys? I can see this is a challenge question to me because uh, I would imagine that uh, the with my most of the time I use right nowadays, I use a butterfly IQ and the footprint uh, is relatively small. Um, to measure a really large cyst, sometimes out of the, the window, I will have a problem there too. I always say, oh, maybe the radiologist has a better machine. What? I don't know if a certain machine has a panorama kind of uh, uh, capability that uh, you can measure that way, but uh, my personal machine here don't have that capability. We, we, we would use a regular, you know, a low frequency curved, curved array, curved linear array scan head for that. And um, you have to do the best you can. They can be difficult. Uh, difficult to scan, but if you scan them from the flank with a low-frequency low scan head, I think you'll have the best, best chance. Thank you both. Lori, I think this might be a good one for you. It's, it's about our, our certificate programs. Um, and the question is, with the POCA Certification Academy being an online program, how are my hands-on skills assessed? That is a great question. So within our certificates and our certifications, there's two parts. There's the assessments where you're in clinical case scenarios. It's basically the test. And then there's the other part, which is we consider the practical. 
So your peers are going to be attesting to your abilities. So if you know how to um, appropriately capture depth or, um, you know, there's several different questions that will be asked. And then in our certifications, it goes one step further. You're actually going to have to submit two videos per content area within the certification. And those will be graded by um, clinicians to see if it's appropriate for, for your submission. Thank you. That was a great answer. <clears throat> um, another question that came in during registration uh, is about joint injections. And I'm not sure, I'll ask the question. We'll see, we'll see if our panel of experts are able to answer this one. Do you have advice on integrating joint injections in emergency department patients? And then the second part is, which patients are good candidates for ED injections? I do join the injection here on the ultrasound, but I thought of this question uh, regarding in the ER. Most of the people go to the ER with the joint of pain, or even in the primary care clinic. The first question is, should I do injection? Because the first thing I need to rule out is the infection. Um, does the patient have any symptom or any sign or any exam concern for infection? Because uh, I only do injection after I rule out bad infection. Um, so, I think that's more of a clinic judgment rather than, you know, a point of care ultrasound uh, decision. Um, so it's not necessary in the ER, in the clinic here. Uh, if I want to do injection, then first, if acute really looks like inflamed the joint, I will get a tap first, I get a crystallinized uh, cell differential of those. So I say at least that either it consistent with gout or crystal disease, or if it consistent with bacteria, I would not do any injection. If someone coming in the primary care clinic, more of a chronic issue, has a for a while, or just gradually get worse, in that case, then I'll do it aspiration and the injection at that time. But the first question, the first thing I always thought of was to make sure there is no bacterial infection there. Thank you. Dr. Ziller, I think this might be a good question for you that's come in. It's talking about DBT and I think that, I'm non-clinical for all of our attendees. I am a non-clinical person. Um, and so I, this actually might not be vascular, but I'm not sure. The question is, uh, when would you use a two-point POCUS versus a three-point for DBT? And is there a difference in the two exams? Um, and I'll just kind of pause there and, and let you let you, you talk know, we about will, it. That, that is a vascular question, and I should be able to say something about it. Um, well, well, the, the, the two-point or two-zone compression exam that the that, the, uh, that they're asking about uh, is, is uh, well established and it's best applied in, in the emergency room or ambulatory outpatient setting in patients who have a symptomatic extremity and, and one wants to rule out a deep vein thrombosis. And in that setting, when it's properly done, it, it seems to work very, very well uh, for the detection of proximal symptomatic deep vein thrombosis. Um, the term three zone or four zone, I'm not that's not as well um, defined. I assume that they mean uh, maybe doing one more compression in the mid femoral vein or something like that. Uh, but most of the literature is about the two zone and, and that, that's a valid test. And we encourage people to use it if, uh, if they're skilled enough to do it. And if, if it's positive, then the patient has a DVT and can be treated on that basis. Um, I still recommend that they get a whole leg duplex at some point to document the extent of the DVT, but um, but it is it, 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 the sensitivity specificities are very very good. Um, so uh, and it and the, the two zone compression test can also be combined with with other things like D dimers and uh, and pre test probability screening like the Well score if you're so inclined to make it even more uh, definitive. So I'll, 
I'll stop there and see if anybody has any other comments. Okay, perfect. Um, that was, I, I think that that's really interesting. And I know, I don't know, Lori, if you want to talk, we do have a DVT certificate. Um, and I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about our certificate. I'm kind of, that's not a question that's come in, but it seems like it's kind of connected. So I thought I'd throw it your way. Yeah, of course. Thank you. Um, so yeah, yes, as Maddie said, we do have a lower extremity DVT uh, clinical certificate. And um, the prerequisite to take that is actually to successfully pass the POCUS fundamentals assessment certificate. And or if you're uh, an AIR DMS or APCA registrant, you um, it's bypassed for you. But you, we do also require that you have to have been performed and participated in the interpretation of the POCUS exams for uh, 20 cases within the last two years. So that's a prerequisite that we have in order for you to take that assessment. And um, I don't know how much more detail do you want me to give, Matt? I can go on for days about testing, so I don't want to bore anybody. I'm sure there's more clinicians than eager test takers. That was great, Lori. Thanks for talking about it. Um, obviously, if anyone has any POCA Certification Academy questions, we're happy to answer those. Um, it looks like most of the questions that are coming in are clinical, so I'm going to steer us back in that direction. Um, the next question that has come in is, uh, how does one see and track a PD catheter with fluid in the abdomen? And I don't know if that's I'll just kind of leave it, leave it hanging out there and see if anyone wants to answer that one. Could you repeat the question one more time? I'd be happy to. The question is, um, oh, I've lost it. There it is. How does one see and track a PD catheter with fluid in the abdomen? A P catheter? A P is in Paul, D is in David catheter. That peritoneal dialysis. Oh, okay. Yeah. I don't have experience with that, but uh, I don't know if, uh, based on my experience of tracking other things, I always do a transverse, find the catheter or find the object. Then I go different direction, like in the proximal or distal, and I just follow, see where it goes. But that's just in general for the for the catheter, the dialysis catheter, I never personally did a scan on it. Yeah, no, I haven't. I haven't tried to do that either. But but I would think that it would be relatively easy to to, to find a catheter in in fluid because it's relatively easy, for example, to see uh, pick lines and subclavian vein lines uh, in in blood vessels. They're they're very echogenic and distinctive looking and relatively easy to spot. Thank you. And uh, the next one that's come in is also, um, well, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not even gonna guess at clinical categories anymore. Uh, this one, the question is, when scanning for an abdominal aorta for aneurysms, should we be scanning the upper or lower uh, abdominal area? Well, th that's a good question because, um, because uh, sometimes this is misunderstood. It depends on what you mean by upper and lower abdomen. But, um, but if you just look at an abdomen, you can even look at your own abdomen, I suppose, right? Um, but the aortic bifurcation is really about at the level of the umbilicus, the belly button. So it's right sort of in the middle of your abdomen. So if, you, if you're scanning the lower abdomen, you're gonna miss the abdominal aorta altogether. So the, uh, the, the answer, the simple answer to the question is the upper abdominal, or, or scan the upper abdomen if you're looking for the abdominal aorta um, between the, you know, the lower margin of the rib cage or the ziploid process and the, and the uh, and the umbilicus, so pretty much a straight line, just a little to the to the uh, left would take you over the abdominal aorta. But once you get below the belly button, you're you're really into the pelvis and and into the iliac vessels. Thank you, Dr. Zeller. Lori, we've had one that's come in that I think is relevant for you. Can international clinicians take POCA certification assessments? Yes, they can. We actually have a number of uh, international uh, healthcare practitioners who have taken our assessments. 
Great, thank you. Kind of as a follow up to that one, uh, I see we have a number of students on this on this chat with us. Um, so I'm going to ask it for them. But they're still in school. Are they also eligible? Um, so they are eligible for the POCUS Fundamentals Certificate. We just ask for that prerequisite um, that you have some healthcare training and background. Come prepared. We do have resources on our website in order to take that certificate um, and then also again you would have to meet the prerequisites if you are a student do you have you participated and performed the interpretation of a POCUS scan um, and then the number of scans depending on the content area thank you another question that's come in is cardiac related what is or which is the best echo view of the heart I'll pass that one to Dr. Sheehan. <laughs> the best of you of the window for the cardiac. I think the uh, I don't have the answer for a general medical situation, but uh, I, what I mean is that this is uh, depends on what clinical question you try to answer. And then the most popular window people get is the parasternal non access and the probably a short access to. I would say the next popular window is the APIC four chamber window. The subzyphoid window primarily used for the uh, fast scan, but you can also uh, see sometimes you see all the four chambers, sometimes you may not be able to see all the four chambers. So I, it totally depends on cleaning a question. Thank you. I think uh, kind of as a follow up for that question, um, the next question that's come in is, can you determine EF accurately while performing a POCUS echo? And then if so, would we also be using a four chamber view for that? So with the trained eyes, uh, you can determine the EF to a certain accuracy. And the literature says probably the difference between individual uh, hoax users or like a, a cardiologist, I can be up to 10%. Um, certain machine, has the software capability, and you can, there are a couple of ways, like a take the method, the, the Samson method that you can use. So like, if you use, uh, uh, you could uh, use the parasternal non-access to measure the EF, or you could uh, use the APIC four chamber view to measure the uh, EF. So sometimes that depends on which window has a better quality, you can use those. They have a, also have a limitation too, like if you use the external access, and sometimes it require you have a near normal morphology heart-wise. Thank you. I think we've had another follow-up question. Cardiology seemed to excite people. Uh, the next question that's come in is, which view is best to determine pericardial effusion and tamponade? So the pericardial effusion and tamponade, uh, you, in order to see that, uh, in order to see the right ventricle. If you have me pick one, I would say probably the APIC of four chamber, you can see it. That's where you can see both. And uh, as I mentioned, the subdiphoid window, sometimes you can see the right ventricle too. So those are the two values that I think you can see better. And uh, like with uh, short access, external short access, you might be able to say, but I would say the APIC4 chamber or subdiphoid uh, window is the choice. Thank you. We also seem to have a follow-up question about our AAA discussion earlier. The um, follow-up question is, while performing a AAA scan, 
is it possible to accurately measure aortic diameter if the vessel is tortuous or if the patient has a spine deformity? Well, it can certainly be more difficult because because you don't know exactly sort of how you, how your ultrasound plane is is intersecting the aorta, but uh, you can scan from different angles and, and try to get the most uh, orthogonal plane or you know plane at right angles to the to the vessel that you can. I mean that's one that's the difference between ultrasound measurements and CT measurements. For example, with a CT scanner, you basically get whatever plane you get by slicing the patient directly, sort of transversely. But with ultrasound, you can actually modify your your image image plane to to suit the tortuosity. So you can scan back and forth and see to get if you can get the best orthogonal view, and that's the that's the way to go. But it can't be a challenge. There's no question about it when when the aorta is tortuous. Thank you. These are really some great questions that are coming in. So thank you to our audience for some really interesting conversation questions. Another one that's come in, I think I'm going to bounce this one to you, Lori, is, is the POCA certification for only for doctors or other clinical providers, example nurses, able to take it? I, I would say to that, if you are a nurse who performs and participates in the interpretation of POCUS, you are eligible to take these certificates or certification. Um, so we actually provide the independent validation clinical providers to show proficiency in POCUS. So that's, that's our goal, not just doctors. Thanks, Lori. Um, yeah, we, we love to support all healthcare practitioners. This is a little bit of an interesting question. Um, so we're, we're shifting gears to lung. Um, is there an initial machine ultrasound setting recommended for visualization of lung structures? Uh, and then they continue to ask specifics, types of transducer you might recommend, frequency, depth, harmonics, breathing techniques. So they really want us to dig into lung ultrasound. Um, before our panelists answer, I will say we do have a, a couple of webinars that are pre pre-recorded and available asynchronously at your leisure on our website. They're free open access and they specifically focus on lung ultrasound. So if we're not able to dig in as deep as you want us to on this webinar, we do have some very focused lung ultrasound webinars available that you can watch at your own leisure. But now I'll open that question up to our, our clinicians. So, uh, any transducer you could use for non ultrasound. Um, is there a presetting initial setting number wise? I don't I don't have a my machine, but my machine has a preset, and a lot of machine has a preset. So if you choose the preset, uh, then it give you the initial setting you need. If your machine doesn't have the non preset, then you could use for me. I could use an abdomen or I could use an MSK, depends on what I'm looking at. If I'm looking at the plural line, I probably use the high linear frequency probe and use the MSK setting. If I'm looking more for like a deep, it's not deep, like a fluid, like a plural effusion or pneumonia, then I would use the curve linear frequency, uh, the curve linear probe, because that gives me a wide uh, visual field. You can always adjust the, the depths or the gains. And my personal experience, if you want to look at like a long sliding, uh, lower the gain probably is better uh, for you to save the sliding. Thank you. Okay, this one I think we actually had a number of questions kind of roll in all at once. So I'm trying to scroll my way through them. Um, the next question, I, I, don't, I don't know who I wanna ping pong this one to, maybe all three of you can answer actually. I'm new to POCUS, where do I start? Well, I, I guess it would depend on what what sort of uh, applications you you think would be most 
suitable for your your practice. Um, I mean, there's there so many that um, you just have to start with one that that you would actually use. So, um, if you're interested in vascular, I could you know you could start with the DVT exam, for example. That's that's probably the most common one, or screening for AAA or or something like that. But um, uh, on the other hand, if you're a critical care physician, you're going to probably start with uh, um, you know, a focused cardiac exam or something. So I, I guess I would have to know a little bit more about a person's background and, and goals before answering a question like that. I totally agree with what Dr. Zainer said. It depends on what you want to do and what your folks say is. Uh, however, I know the Hooks Academy has a generalist certificate, right? Uh, actually, I did that and I have my certificate and I has a bundled a bunch of those individual certificate. Uh, since I'm a family physician, that's what I did. Um, I think if for someone the old to focus, uh, pick the one, it's easy to learn and uh, you can, it's easy for you to interpret and uh, you use that more frequently than other things in your daily practice. That probably that's the thing I would start. Then once you have some background there, it's always easier to expand it to other applications or field. Thank you. I, I'm gonna do a plug. We do have a education program through the Point of Care Certification Academy. It's called our POCUS Education Provider Program, and it lists a number of really fantastic training organizations that we've pre-screened and have kind of pre-approved for um, alignment with our certificates. And so if you, if you feel very salesy right now, but if you go to www.pocus.org uh, and look under education, you'll see our POCUS Education Provider Program, and hopefully that will help connect you with someone to help help train and educate you in the field of focus if you're brand new to it. I'm done being salesy and I'm going to move on to the next question. Um, we've had one come in that, uh, Lori, I'm going to bounce to you. It says, do we need CME to maintain POCUS certification? Uh, as of right now, you don't. Um, I think most of you are aware our program is still very new. Uh, we launched in middle of 2017, so there are still some things um, underway to see what the guidelines will be for a recertification. Thank you. Okay, I'm not done being salesy. I will say, though we don't require it, we offer it. So we do have uh, our POCUS fundamentals includes four ACCME um, category one credits. So with your purchase of the POCUS fundamentals, uh, you can earn credits towards your other CME requirements. But like Lori said, for our requirements, it's it's not required. It's just something that you can earn. Okay, now I swear I'm done being salesy. <laughs> um, but uh, the next question that's come in, uh, Dr. Zeller, I think will be a really good one for you. It's vascular, I think. Uh, while performing an ultrasound guided procedure, which approach is best? Yeah, actually, um, yeah, that come that question comes up a lot. Uh, I assume they're talking about. Uh, needle guided access like putting in a central line or something like that so um, uh, I even had I have a couple of slides open on my desk here and I'll I might try sharing my screen um, let's just see how this works are you, are you seeing my screen there yes Yes. Oh, good. Okay. So basically, there, 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 there are two ultrasound approaches for, for visualizing a needle as you're trying to access a, a vessel in this case. And one is the long axis and the other is the transverse axis. And, and um, the short answer to the question is, is, is neither one is better. They're just different and they, they both have their, their place. Um, the long axis view, as you can see uh, on the left hand side of the slide, um, shows you the length of the vessel and can show you the, the whole needle and where the needle tip is if, if, you're, if you're good enough to keep the needle in the plane of the B-mode image. On the other hand, the transverse view 
will show you the vessel and, and show you your target a little bit better, but it's much more difficult to keep track of where the needle tip is. So that's the, the those are the advantages and disadvantages of both of these. Um, so, so the transverse short axis approach shows you the needle, but it gives you a false sense of security about, about where the needle tip is so you can, so you, the errors can be made. Whereas the longitudinal approach uh, shows you the needle path, but, but, uh, and where the needle tip is, but it doesn't show you where you are, you know, in, in the left to right um, direction. So, and, and this, this is what we used for teaching our um, residents uh, central line access. This is an ultrasound uh, uh, simulator, or this is a simulator that's scannable. Um, and you can see the, the technician there uh, accessing it. And that's the transverse view there. And so, um, and so th these images are actually from the simulator. So they're, they're kind of idealized. But you can see in the transverse view, you, you can see where the, these two vessels are very nicely. And you can actually um, see where the needle is, but you can't really see where the needle tip is. Um, so you, the needle is right there, for example. So if you're trying to get this big thing, which might be the internal jugular vein in a real patient, um, then you could avoid getting this thing, which would be the carotid artery. And there's the needle over here. Um, but, but you don't know where the needle tip is. So uh, in the longitudinal view, you can see the needle and here there's the tip and there's the tip going, going in. So, so to, to answer the original question, I, I, I like to start off in the transverse view because it sort of shows me where the target is and what's around the target. And then as we approach the target, I'd like to switch to the longitudinal view so I can see the tip and I can see the tip actually going into the target vessel like that. So um, yeah, there's the needle tip. So um, yeah, so that's uh, a, a short answer to a, to a, or a long answer to a short question. That was really great. I, I feel like I learned a little bit about vascular there and I am very non-clinical, so thank you. I, yeah. Well, ho hopefully that answered the, the question that was actually being asked, but, but that, that actually <laughs> comes up a lot. So, um, and that's just my own approach. Other, I mean, Dr. Sheehan may have his own approach, but, but that seems to work uh, for me. I want to say, uh, it's my experience, especially at the very beginning, you will have a little bit of hard time to try to maintain your probe in the non-access for like uh, in plain mode. But after a while, then you will get it. And uh, I do MSK. So some, some joint, especially in like an AC joint, usually it's harder to do the uh, in plain mode because of the bones. So you out of plane the method or, or the have a place, or you can always use the out of plane uh, method. Great. Sorry, I am doing a lot of typing. There's a lot of kind of rapid fire coming in. Uh, the next one that's come in um, uh, that I'm going to read, I think is for you, Lori. Uh, I have a POCUS certification and also multiple credentials through ARDMS. Um, and they listed their credentials. And I just want to say congratulations to this person. It's a great list of credentials. And thank you um, for being such a POCUS and ultrasound advocate. Uh, their question is, can I use my CMEs or my regular ARDMS credentials to comply with my POCUS CME requirements? Um, so POCUS doesn't require any CMEs. I am going to make an assumption, so please write uh, if it's a wrong assumption. Uh, I'm assuming you're talking about your CMEs that are required for your ARDMS credentials, so the RDMS or our BT. Um, so unfortunately, we don't waive the CMEs that are required for the ARDMS credentials if you take a POCUS exam. Thank you. Um, this one's actually an, an interesting question. Um, have either, either of you, and I think that they mean our two clinicians, have either of you worked with any COVID positive patients and how did you use ultrasound with those patients? I have uh, not 
use the ultrasound of COVID patient, I have taken care of them. But I did attend it, uh, actually kind of like a pokes of webinar done by Butterfly. Um, their expert showed uh, how this has been done. And in that case, they actually, those institutions got uh, the machine from the company and uh, each patient has a specific machine so they don't use that cross patient for obvious reason. Um, based on what I learned from there is that uh, the changes, the major changes primarily around the, the pleural line, and the pleural line become not as smooth as normally you see. And uh, if the patient has like a pleural effusion, usually it's a small amount, especially at the beginning. But personally, I haven't used the uh, machine on the focus, uh, on the COVID patient here. I, I haven't had, had the need to do a POCUS exam myself on, on any COVID positive patients, but, but of course our sonographers in the vascular laboratories that I'm responsible for uh, have had to do that. Uh, and of course they use the, the full PPE uh, that, that's available uh, with, you know, the same, they're, they're trained in the same procedures that the rest of the hospital staff have access to. Yeah, but we all, one, of, one of the modifications we did make was to try to limit their, their, the time that they need to spend with the COVID positive patients because, you know, risk is proportional to exposure time. So our goal was to, to perform the shortest exam possible and still get the information that was, that was needed. So for example, if it was a rule out DVT exam uh, and, they, and they found a, a proximal DVT, they didn't have to scan the cat veins the way we ordinarily would because that would take a lot more time or they wouldn't have to scan an asymptomatic leg. Uh, for a bilateral exam if, if, if the symptomatic leg was positive. So we did make uh, some, some sort of temporary exceptions uh, or temporary shortcuts in order to uh, balance um, diagnostic value and, and stenographer safety. So, I, I mean, the same would apply, I think, to a, a person doing a point of care exam. Thank you. I, I know we've, we've, we've also done a couple of COVID specific webinars. So for those who have an interest in learning more about how POCUS was um, and is uh, used during uh, to scan COVID positive patients, those webinars are on POCUS.org. So check those out. Um, Lori, a question for you. Uh, is the POCUS, um, is POCUS certification available for radiology specialists? So yes, uh, um, we do have two certifications right now, the generalist certification and then the emergency medicine certification. So um, there are different exams within those. I would probably just advise you to go to POCUS.org to look at which clinical areas are within each certificate. And again, make sure you meet those prerequisites of being have performed and participated in the inter interpretation of a number of scans that are on the website also. Yeah. Sounds like a broken record a little bit. <laughs> I mean, it almost sounds like the question was being asked from the point of view of whether there was some limitation on, on mm -hmm. which specialties could, could take it. And the answer is, is definitely no. Yeah. Um, any, any medical specialist um, or any medical specialty is, that uses ultrasound is, is appropriate. Um, and uh, as we already said, physicians, physicians assistants, nurses, etc. We welcome everybody. <laughs> yes. That's great. Thank you. Um, here's a question about gallbladder scanning. Um, what position should we have the patient in for a gallbladder scan? So uh, for me, I usually started with the patient, probably semi-recumbent, uh, about 30 degree-ish. Um, on the back, I started with that position. If I don't see well, then I have the patient to turn to left decubitus. Um, 
if I still don't see well, you only then I'll try the x minus seven method. Basically, it goes through the intercost of space and try to see. In theory, if you suspect a stone, sometimes you can have the patient stand up and to see if the stone move with those. Uh, but generally, I start with uh, uh, supine. Then, if needed, I have patient roll to the left side. Thank you. Um, here is another question about IVC diameter. So how effective is IVC diameter to determine CVP, it's a couple of acronyms for you, and volume status? And then they continue, there's two more parts to it. So I'll let you answer that. And then there's two other parts that follow up with that. Brian, you can take that one if you want. I, 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 the, the short answer, I, I don't know the details of it, but, but the IVC scanning is, is helpful for assessing volume status, um, both, both the absolute size and, the, and the, the relative change in size during respiration. But I'll leave the details to Dr. Sheehan. All right, so there is a table out there on the internet, have more information than what I needed to remember. Uh, for the IVC diameter and the capacity, things like that. So when I teach the resident here, I tell them that probably you need to remember two numbers, the lower number and then the upper number for the diameter and then the possibility. So if we look at someone Google that, you will say if you have uh, the diameter is small, less than 1.5, and then if you have a collapsibility more than 50%, then generally say it's the CVP is less than five. On the other side, if your diameter is more than 2.5 or two, and you have a minimally collapsible IVC, the table tell you the CVP is around 20. And there are some variation there in between. And based on what I know, it sounds like there are evidence to support this table to a certain degree. And here, when we do an echo, actually the formal echo, well, including the IVC, and you will get the information regarding the diameter and the collapsibility. Thank you. The two follow-up questions, and, and you may have touched on this a little bit, but I'm going to ask them. Um, so the initial question was, how effective is IVC to determine CVP? And then the two follow-up is, anything that we need to be careful about? Any exclusions? So the first question kind of partially answered there. The second question, I think it's an important question. The, Key here is that even you say a dilated IVC and barely like collapsible, doesn't necessarily say this is a heart failure. Needed to consider other situations that can cause those, like someone could have a tension pneumo, someone could have a restrictive pericarditis, all those conditions can cause this uh, like uh, the IVC be dilated and uh, barely collapsible. So I think uh, IVC measurement uh, is a data point for the clinician, but you need uh, to integrate that into your clinical picture to, uh, to figure out what the exact cause. Thank you. Um, here's another question. Um, I, I think we're getting, we're still getting some questions rolling in. I do with an eye on time. We have about 10 minutes left um, and I have a queue of a couple of questions. So if there are any other questions out there that you've been thinking about asking, make sure you get those submitted now so that I can be sure to get them in our queue of questions and get to it before our time runs out. The next question that's come in, uh, Lori, I think is a great one for you. Will we get an ID card after completing POCUS like we do after completing an ARDMS exam? 
what you'll actually get is a digital badge. So when you successfully complete a certificate or certification, you can either, so you'll get two things. You can either print your certificate or certification from your uh, profile page, and you can also get a digital badge, and that's where you can share it. Um, LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, WhatsApp, there's several platforms that you can share that, and you can also put it on your email signature if you wish. That's kind of cool. Um, thank you. I think this is a great one for both clinicians. Um, so the question is, what are the best resources outside of training workshops? So this is a little bit challenging. So outside of attending a workshop, what are the best resources to educate myself on using POCUS in order to best optimize my patient's results? Alexander, you want to try this question first? We've stumped our clinicians. Uh, <laughs> Dr. Zeller, you are muted. Uh, so the, the, the question was, besides going to workshops, what are some of the best? Um, well, I mean, there, 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 there are a number of online resources that you can, you can, um, uh, there's a, um, I'm going to get it wrong, but the, the, the Society of, um, uh, there, there's a, um, a website for um, uh, medical students that, uh, that has a variety of ultrasound related content on it that, that, uh, that I, I've directed people to in the past. I haven't looked at it in a little while. Um, but I would, I would look around for, um, for uh, web-based resources that include videos is just reading books is not going to be enough. So you, you're going to want some video content. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, there's a lot out there on the internet. Unfortunately, some of, you know, the quality it may, may not uh, be consistent, but, um, but, uh, but the cost is, is very low. So I agree with the doctor's manner, the most, in addition to the workshop, what I use is probably it's a free online medical education format. And I'm not sure if there are any studies regarding what I learned from YouTube, how the quality is, but I feel like YouTube taught me a lot. And if I have question, especially regarding clinical care ultrasound, I can always type on the question there when looking for that specific uh, scan, and I can always find uh, someone show me there. Uh, other things, there are a couple of like uh, uh, online resources I use, um, especially for the resident teaching here, um, because when they have this two weeks of uh, corner care ultrasound rotation with me, they may not be able to see every possible pathology uh, a patient have. Um, so I use a, there is a website called the POCUS Atlas, and they actually have the, uh, a lot of like information, including pathology there. We actually go over the major pathology for each system um, to make sure at least they see it once. Um, because I had a, a orthopedics background, so when I call, uh, MSK is also one for my folks that area. Um, there are a couple of websites there too. Um, I think uh, there is a called uh, authorsono.com and they have uh, like a Twitter call for different uh, joint uh, Anatomy, injection, and uh, some just a pathology. Those are the sites I usually go to. But if you ask me the most common visitor site for corner care child to center learning, I would say YouTube is my teacher. I love, we, you gotta love YouTube, right? Um, I would also add, I, I have a feeling the, the impetus or the stimulus for this question was probably the lack of ability to travel right now and attend in-person workshops. And so I would also add a number of educators and trainers are moving to online options. 
um, kind of a blended learning style where you do the, um, the didactic and the knowledge-based learning online. And then when things open back up, they're offering the in-person training to help supplement that. Um, but check out uh, some of the, the online providers. Um, some of our POCUS education providers are, have moved to online, so, so do check those out. Um, but if that was the impetus, and I'm not certain that that was, that was what was the stimulus for this question, but if it was, a lot of programs have moved virtual um, during this time. Yeah, oh, I, just, I, just, I just looked up the, the name of the site that I couldn't remember on the spur of the moment. It, 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 it sus me, Society for Ultrasound in Medical Education. And they, um, I haven't looked at it for a while, but they, they had some great content on it the last time I looked. Thank you. Yeah, and, and just kind of adding to that, a lot of associations and societies are offering some really incredible free open um, workshops, webinars, um, online programming right now. And so do check out Sesame um, and, and many of the other societies and associations that are out there. Here's a really interesting question. I'm gonna kind of tie two questions um, together. Uh, so the question that came in is asking about simulation uh, and simulator programs such as Sonosim to help train. Um, and I think that it's a great follow up to this question about learning outside of workshops is their simulators. Um, and then kind of to tag team behind that. So the question is, are there any simulator programs that you would recommend? And then to tag team and combine just with an eye on time, do you have any equipment, any ultrasound machines that you would recommend? Um, well, unfortunately, as far as simulation goes, there, there are, are not any really good um, widely available simulators for, for vascular ultrasound at this point. Um, and that would include the, the point of care applications of DVT and, and AAA. Um, there are some phantoms that are scannable that, that, that have some arteries in them, but, um, but simulators haven't, um, haven't really reached a, a, a much of a threshold for, for vascular applications. Uh, coincidentally, I, there is a group at University of Washington where I am that's working on a duplex ultrasound simulator, and, and they actually have some modules for carotid duplex um, and, and transcranial doppler, but they're not focused on point of care. They're more focused on the, the, uh, the professional sonographer. So we have, uh, uh, since someone already mentioned the name, Sonos M Simulator with us for many years. Um, I like that uh, for the didactic part, it's uh, excellent uh, for the didactic part. Um, but if you want to maintain for long-term, the cost is an issue. Um, so, I like what they have for uh, pathologies and cases there. Um, right now, we did not, uh, we, we use it for the resident when they do uh, point of care out to center rotation. So they use that as a supplement to the didactic component. So they have to go over those modules we purchased. Um, I know in house we have a, a OB uh, phantom and the cardiac phantom uh, student to use, but personally, I, I don't have experience with this except I worked at a, a workshop years ago and scanned for OB. Um, I think a simulator can certainly help uh, the manner, especially you have a folks that area. Um, but my experience with seminar is also very different from a real patient scan, especially for ultrasound. And it's so individualized and then you have to kind of get to the best window and everyone's, everyone's body contour is different and maybe the, comp the tissue composition is different. Thank you. Well, with an eye on time, I do think that that is going to wrap up our webinar today. This has been fantastic. I just wanna give a huge thank you to 
Lori, Dr. Sheehan, and Dr. Zeeler, thank you to the three of you for being here, for being our mentors this evening. So thank you. Um, I do, as you guys know, I do like to do little plugs. And so I am going to do a plug. We have an upcoming webinar in July, on July 21st at 2 o'clock p.m. Eastern Time. And it is focusing on kind of continuing this conversation a little bit, but it's when POCUS becomes culture and expanding POCUS utilization through expanded curricula. And so I, I would like to invite all of you to join us at that webinar in July. And I just wanna again say thank you. This does conclude our, our discussion for today. A recording of this discussion will be available on POCUS.org. Uh, later this week. And so do check that out if you want to share it with your colleagues. It's available for you to share. Uh, and I hope you all have a wonderful evening. <laughs>